But my commission from the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, has been to come to this church, Evangelical Christian Church of Waterbury, and I am his under-shepherd, I am your shepherd, and my job as a shepherd is to basically do three things, and then out of that flows many other things. But the first job of an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ is to love the sheep, to love the people. Jesus said, a new command I give unto you that you love one another. By this you will know that you are my disciples if you love one another, John 13. The second thing a shepherd is supposed to do is to feed the sheep. Remember Jesus said to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my lambs. Very important. And that's my, something that I love to do. I love to study the Bible. And then the third thing in that order is to lead the sheep. How many know a shepherd is to lead the sheep? You don't lead the sheep over a cliff. <laughs> You don't leave them, lead them into a desert. You lead them uh, by still waters. You lead them into green pastures. And then out of that, a shepherd, you know, we comfort one another when we lose some of the people from our family. We rejoice in birthdays. We rejoice in weddings and anniversaries. We rejoice in graduations. And uh, sometimes, you know, there are times when the shepherd has to correct the sheep. There are some times when shepherds are grateful and praise the sheep. Just different things that you do as a shepherd. Then there are times when something goes through a sheep's life that they just don't even know if God is on their side anymore. And someone called that the dark night of the soul. I don't know if you ever heard that term, dark night of the soul, but if you've been a follower of Jesus Christ long enough, everyone in the church history have gone through a dark night of the soul, and it's when God tests you to your core. And I want to talk about that today uh, and understanding the ways of God. Sometimes people oversimplify God. And let me tell you something. The gospel is simple. The Christian life is simple. But some of the seasons we live in life aren't so simple. How I many know coming through COVID, that was not an easy uh, season to come through at all. Some people say, well, you know, if I could just hear God's voice, everything would be fine. Yes, it's wonderful. If God would just give me a promise or a dream, or if I could just uh, get an angelic visitation, wouldn't that be nice if an angel came down? And It would be nice. But to hear God speak... You have to do what he says to do, and it's better not to hear him speak and disobey, or it's better not to hear him speak than to hear him and disobey, and because he, he wants you to love and to obey him. Now, in Psalm 103, verse 7, the psalmist wrote, to Moses, God showed his ways. But to the children of Israel, he showed his acts. You know what he's saying? There are some Christians that are a lot more mature than other Christians. Some Christians are very immature, very fickle. Oh, just give me an act. Just give me a miracle. Just give me a sign. Just give me a wonder. Just give me this. Just let me feel good. And God says, yeah, I'll give you that. That's what he did to Israel. But to Moses... Moses says, I don't want to just have miracles. I want to know the why behind the miracle. I want to know the how behind the miracle. I want to know why you wait sometimes and why you don't. Or other people, they don't grasp that with God. And I want to talk to you next two weeks on the ways of God. You can put up there the title, The Ways of God. And today I want to talk to you about perceiving God's ways. You're going to look at someone today, a prophet of God, that got very angry with God. He was very... T Anyone ever been angry at God before? Put your hand up. Oh, we got a few honest people. You know where liars go. They don't go to purgatory. <laughs> and it's good to know sometimes, well, I'm not the only one that ever gets upset with God. And so in Jeremiah, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to read some verses about the prophet Jeremiah who was called, he was commissioned by God as a teenager, very young. 
and God spoke to him. And God gave him promises. And God says, I have a good plan for you. And then when it began to work out, it didn't work out the way God thought it would. And he got mad. He got mad. So let's, let's look at Jeremiah. Why don't you stand? We'll just change our positions. Jeremiah 1, verses 4 to 8, Janelle. This, this is one of the great passages that talk about that before you were born, God knew you. Did you know that? That's why we as believers don't believe in abortion. We believe life begins at conception, but God knew you even before that. So, you read the even verses with me, and I'll read the odd verses, okay? So let's begin together, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Verse 6. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Verse 7. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth. I mean, you know, when God tells you something, don't, don't talk God out of what he's saying. Don't say, I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Verse 8. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. You know why it says don't be afraid of their faces? Because they're not going to like what you have to say. My people are not going to like the word of the Lord. They're not going to like the man of God. They're not going to like the prophet of God. Don't be afraid of them, though. You tell them what I speak. Now go down to verse 18, please. Verse 18, Janelle. Let's read it together. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and a bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, and against the people of the land, verse 19, they will fight against you. They will fight against the man of God. They will fight against the prophetic word. They will fight against what is good. They will fight against this book. The people of God, you listening to me? <laughs> the people of God will fight against this. And he's telling them, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. All right, Janelle, now fast forward to Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 1, please. Jeremiah 20, verse 1. Jeremiah has the word of the Lord, the prophetic gift. He heard from God. He has the promise and a wonderful plan. And now he's functioning as the man of God, the prophet of God, with the anointing of God. And I'll read this to you. Now Pasher, the son of Imler, the priest, who was also the chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Verse 2. Then Pasher struck Jeremiah, punched him. I'm glad they don't treat men of God like that anymore. But <laughs> he, he struck Jeremiah, the prophet, and he put him in stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin which was by the church. They locked up the man of God right by the church. Isn't that something? And then go down to verse 7, please, uh, Janelle, verse 7. And he's in there, Jeremiah, abused by the people of God, the stubborn people of God didn't want to listen to him, and he gets mad at God, and he says, Oh, Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. A better translation is in the King James and the um, New American Standard Version. It says, Oh Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived. You ever, been, you ever felt deceived by God? You are stronger than I. You can't outbox God. Don't even try. And have prevailed. I am a derision daily. Everyone mocks me. They mock the man of God. Next verse, please. Verse 8. For when I spoke, I cried out, and I shouted. 
violence and plunder against the man of God. Why? Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Here he's preaching the word of God, and the people were so carnal, so deceived, so backwards, that they beat up the man of God, locked him up, and mocked him. So let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we ask in Jesus' name as we talk about trying to perceive your ways, that you would give us ears to hear, you would give us eyes to see, and we would not be stubborn. And Lord, we would not, Father, miss what you're trying to do in our day and age, in our lives. Help us, Lord, to trust you, no matter what we don't understand. You're always a good God. We believe you're a good God. Help us to understand and learn something new today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated, please. So let's talk about this perceiving God's ways. Because if you haven't gone through it yet, there's going to come a time in your life when you're going to think God is mad at you or you tick God off or there's some hidden sin that you don't know about and everything is falling apart and you're like, what is up, God? And you need to perceive his ways are so different from ours. Now, Jeremiah had a clear call of God. He was a prophet. God told him, I'm going to use you with this people and I'm going to protect you. You're a fortified city. You're a bronze wall. And God told them this. But it seemed like later on in his life when they beat him up, put him in, in stocks and humiliated him in front of the house of God, that the bronze wall collapsed. That he wasn't protected from God. That maybe God was deceiving him. It's kind of sad. Let's, let's go to the first verse. I put a better translation in there because sometimes you're going to feel like Jeremiah if you walk close with God. Put the next verse in there, please, from uh, Jeremiah 20. O Lord, this is the New American Standard Version, you have deceived me. You gave me a word of God and it didn't come to pass. You told me you would do this. I got hit. You deceived me and I was deceived. And God, you have overcome me and prevailed. I have been a laughingstock all day. Everyone mocks me because I'm a Christian. Anyone been there? You're in good company. Jeremiah had a very hard job prophesying the word of the Lord. They not only hit him, they mocked him. They attacked his character. They laughed at what he was saying, even though it was the word of God. Went around telling lies about him. You know, there's another man of God that happened to when God came and visited him. He was a youth. And God gave him two dreams that he would rule over his brothers. And one day he would rule over his mother and father. Does anyone know who it was? Joseph. Remember Joseph? And do you remember what happened? He had a word from God, a prophetic dream. Do you remember what happened after that? His brothers beat him up threw them down a dry well, sold them into slavery. He was accused of rape, which he never did, and he was thrown in jail unjustly. Makes you wonder, I, I don't think I want a prophecy. <laughs> I don't think I want to hear what God has to say. No, you do. You just need to understand how precious the word of the Lord is and don't move away from it. Very important. I'm sure some of you have thought you've heard God speak, and you probably did hear God speak, and you thought it would turn out just so good the next day, or what he told you was going to happen very soon, and you've been waiting, and you've been waiting, and you've been waiting, and it's like, hello? Are you there? It's perceiving the ways of God. Maybe God told you to do something, you went and did it, and it blew up in your face. And you say, God, I thought you told me to go talk. Or maybe God said, go, there's an offense between you and sister so-and-so. Go sit down and talk to them. So you went and you talked to sister so-and-so. And boom, she blew up and told you off. And you're like, God, I thought, I, I thought you told me to do this. And 
Are you deceiving me, God? Maybe it was talking to someone about forgiveness. And the person didn't even know they offended you. And instead of helping, you made the situation worse. I thought I heard you, God. What's going on? Jeremiah said, you deceived me, O God. How many know it's okay to be honest with God sometimes? Respectful, but honest. How many know God can take it? He can take it. You deceive me. Jeremiah had a broken heart. He's doing what God told him to do. He believed it. He remembered it. He wrote it down from a youth. Before you were even born, I knew you. I sanctified you. I called you as a prophet to the nations. And he's trying to do it, but he doesn't get God's ways of doing things. And how many know if Jeremiah, the man of God, doesn't understand, how many know you're going to miss it a little bit once in a while? Go to the next verse, please. Isaiah 55. I memorized this as a young man. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. (laughs) For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Here's what a young carnal Christian does when they feel God has deceived them and has hurt them and they get mad. They reach up to heaven and they say, God, I'm going to pull your infinite, unlimited mind down to my puny little limited mind and I'm going to try to understand you. And if I don't understand you, I'm going to get mad. God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts. You can't even understand what I'm doing, but you have to trust me. Do you trust in the Lord with all your heart? Do you lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him? Do you trust that will direct your path? Yeah, but I don't understand. It never says without understanding it's impossible to please God, but without faith. You've got to trust him. Jeremiah says, I am doing what you told me to do. I'm prophesying. These people, your people, are wicked. And you told me you're going to protect me. You gave me a word. You gave me a prophecy. You spoke to me in a vision, and your word ain't working. I tried your word. It ain't working. Next verse. Verses Isaiah 55, verse 10. Put the next verse up there, please. This is a wonderful verse. Just in case you think God's word doesn't work. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me, what? It shall not return to me void. But it will accomplish what I please, and it will prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You believe that? Can you hang on to that? Even though what he told you hasn't come back, hasn't come through, it's not void. I always tell, God speaks in twos. One prophecy is never enough. You got, I, I, was, I had a word of the Lord to someone this week, and God inspired me to give a personal prophecy. And I said, does that make sense to you? He goes, yep, it confirms what's in my heart. I said, good. That's what most prophecy is supposed to do, confirm what God is speaking in your heart. Jeremiah, he, he, he just got confused. He was having a dark night of the soul. He didn't understand God's ways. Well, I mean, oh, God was still working. He was still moving. God speaks to me a lot in dreams. And when God speaks to me in dreams, he speaks to me in dreams in eternity. And then I have the dream in time. And I think the dream's going to happen in six months or a year. But some dreams take 20 years. 20 years to come to pass. Because there's no time in eternity. God says, oh, this is going to happen. And you're like, yeah, in 20 years. And God says, can you trust me? Can you wait? Let's talk about A, the plans of God. 
How many know God has good plans for you? I quote Jeremiah 29, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. I have good plans for you. You need to know that so when things fall apart, (laughs) you say by faith, God still has good plans for me. God still has good plans. Perceiving the ways of God, there's a scripture in Proverbs 26.2, I think it is, 25.2. And Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived on the face of the earth outside of Jesus Christ, he said, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. Proverbs 25.2. You see, when God hides stuff from us, If we're not thinking right, we think, God's mad at me. God's against me. God's hiding. And God says, no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm hiding something from you so that you will seek me to find out what it is. It is the glory of God to conceal the matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. Jesus did this. Remember, he would speak in parables. And none of the crowd would come and say, what do these parables mean? And, God says, and Jesus said, you know, they have ears to hear, but their hearts grow dull. I tell them truths in parables, but no one asks me what they mean except who? The disciples. Jesus would hide things so that you would ask him, what does that mean? And yet a lazy person says, I'm not going to ask him. I don't care. I'm too busy. And God says, if you really want the blessing, you've got to press into me. You've got to know what the plan of God is. Another thing to know about perceiving the ways of God, put number one up there, please, is that uh, behind every promise, number one, Janelle, please, behind every promise, there is a problem. Well, my computer's not working. Janelle, number one. Behind every promise of God, there is a problem. Don't forget that. I'm giving you the deep ways of God that he didn't give to the children of Israel, he gave to Moses. Anytime God gives you a promise, he gives you faith for the promise, and he lets the devil unleash everything against you to test the faith of the promise. Do you believe God can fulfill the promise? And I often say, now, when God gives you a prophetic word, when God gives you a promise, when something from the word of God and the devil, you know, comes after you, keep your eyes on Christ. He's testing what's inside of you. Many times Christians try to fulfill the promise without God, and sometimes Christians get into a for-us gospel. Do you know what a for-us gospel is? A for us gospel is, I only want to serve Jesus for what he can do for us. I don't want to serve Jesus for what I can do for him. I just want to serve Jesus for what he can do for us. That's called a for us gospel. But one of the ways of God is, God not only wants to do stuff for you, he wants to do stuff in you, and he wants to do stuff through you. And that's what Moses discovered. That's number two. Put number two up, please. God wants to do something in you, not just something for you. Do you think God was doing something in Jeremiah as well as something through Jeremiah? Do you think he was doing something in Joseph when his brothers beat him up and he was putting character into Joseph so he would be the prime minister next to Pharaoh? Next to Pharaoh. We don't always like that. There's a scripture in Hebrews 5, 8 to 9. It says that Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. This is one of the ways of God. Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And through that suffering, he was made perfect for our salvation. Do you think God would let you suffer a little bit? that you might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? I think so. 
Never suffering in sickness or disease. That's a, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus never suffered through sickness or disease. Don't believe that lie. The suffering has to do with your character, pressure, through faith. That's what it is. Here's a very interesting scripture. Go to the next verse, please, Janelle, in um, Isaiah 53. This is a really strange verse unless you understand the way of God. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, Jesus. It pleased God the Father to put a beating on his son. He put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for what? You could put your name in there for where sin is. It pleased God to bruise his son to make his son Jesus an offering for your salvation. Isn't that strange? But that's how much he loves you. He loves you so much he was willing to bruise his son. Someone once said, sometimes God will bruise you before he uses you. How many have been bruised by God? (laughs) It's not in vain. It's not in vain. He wants to do a work in you and through you. Jeremiah experienced this. He experienced this. Moses experienced this. God says, Moses, go to Egypt and deliver my people. He goes down there. And he thinks the first time he says to Pharaoh, let my people go, he's going to let them go. And Pharaoh says, get out of my face. Don't come back here again. I'm going to kill some of your Hebrew friends for just showing up in front of me. So God gave him a promise, and what did he get first? A problem. He got a problem. That's one of the ways of God, to grow our faith. It's not always easy. And then he finally gets them delivered, and he gets all these millions of Hebrews out of Egypt, and God leads them to the Red Sea. Another problem. But we don't know the miracle that God was going to do in dividing the Red Sea, do we? See, sometimes God brings us to a dead end and we go, What are you doing, God? Let me bring your infinite mind down here where I can understand you. Say with me, God is God. I am not. God is God. I am not. Remember that. He has good plans for you. He knows what he's doing. Let's go to the next one, the promises of God. Jesus Christ not only died for your salvation, for your healing, but he died that you would live a godly life. He would have what you need. He could work in you and through you, and he would give you promises. A mature Christian lays hold of the promises of God. Peace, answered prayer, healing, joy, Whatever it is, every promise in the book is ours, amen? Through faith in Jesus Christ. But we have to go after it. Jeremiah was promised to be protected. At least he thought so. Kind of seemed like it. And he was pretty excited. He was really excited. Put the next scripture up there. If God gave you this verse, you'd probably think like Jeremiah. He said, do not be afraid of their faces, Jeremiah. I am with you. To deliver you, says the Lord. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city in an iron pillar. that a good word? Against kings and princes and priests and the people of the land, Jeremiah 1.8. I mean, it's great sometimes when you have a dream or get a prophetic word. You feel so good about it. But then, (laughs) things, the problem comes, doesn't it? And what's the purpose of the problem? Janelle, go to number one, please. A promise is to build your faith. Number one, please. Number one. A promise of God is to what? A promise of God is to build your faith. 
And God intended for his promises to build your faith, not in your own faith, not in your positive confession, not in your positive attitude, but in him. How I many you know it's not just having faith, but it's who the object of your faith is that is important. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Sometimes we get ourselves messed up when God gives us a promise, and then we run out and we think we can fulfill it ourselves, and you know what? You, we create a mess. Listen to me. Some of you get a word from God and you run out and you think you know what it means, and you create a headache. God gives you a promise so that you will see what he will do. He will do it. And he will do something in you, and he will do something through you. How many remember Peter walking on water, and when he had his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on water, and when the wave came and he took his eyes off Jesus, what happened? Yeah. Sank right down. But we've got to keep our eyes on him. Someone said, faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and it receives the impossible. But it's not your faith. It's Christ's faith in us that's working through us. I remember when I was a uh, second year in college, I was just about finishing up, and I had to get a job. I, I'm from southern Ontario, so I was praying about, Lord, when I get home, I'm, in, I'm going to Bible school in Ro Rhode Island, and I got to go back to southern Ontario, Canada. Got to get a job. It's not hard. It's not easy to get a job when you're like 13 hours away. So I was praying, and I felt the Lord tell me, I'm going to give you your painting job with your friend from last year. And I kept praying. I said, I think this is you, Lord. I think this is you. And I felt like he gave me a promise. I was going to be painting again. And I made really good money in painting because I could paint fast. I learned the tricks of the trade. So I called up my friend. He goes, yeah, you know, call me, you know, when you're done, come back, and we'll see what happens. So I come home for this, you know, done school, go home. I'm there, and I call up my friend my first day back, and he says, ah, work is slow. I don't need you right now. Just, you know, call me in a week. And I said, Lord, you told me you're going to, I thought you told me you're going to give me this job. So I call him another week. He says, no, I don't need you. I don't need you. Get, you know, call me in another week. And I said, Lord, I, I'm a Bible. I'm, a, I'm in school. I need money. I can't wait around, God. And so I got mad at God. I went and got another job. Three days into my other job, my friend called me. Hey, Paul, I need you. How much is it? Well, he told me it was triple where I was working. And I said, I'll see you Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I got upset with God. Did you even speak to me, God? Yeah, he spoke to me. He was doing something in me and not just something for me. How many know... You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, but first it might make you miserable. Sometimes the truth makes you a little miserable. Which brings me to my second point about the promises of God in your life and my life. Not only are they there to help your faith, but a promise will always teach you patience. This is the way of God. You cannot escape it. You will always be tested with patience when God speaks to you and you have to wait for him to do what he said he's going to do. I had to wait three weeks. I was trying to be responsible, but the Lord made up. In the money I made in painting, he made up for it from the other job. Well, I didn't understand that. Jeremiah didn't understand it. He said, Lord, you said I would be a wall. I'd be a brazen wall. I'd be a pillar. And yet they beat me up. They humiliated me. They locked me up like right in front of the church, put me in stock. And everyone's going to the temple. And everyone's looking, hey, hey there's the man of God. There's the prophet of God. They're all mocking him. How I many know oh, God was still on the throne? God was still going to do what he was going to do. And even though you don't understand God and I don't understand God, and we don't always perceive what he's doing, he still can be trusted. 
there's a scripture in Philippians 3.10. Most people only quote part A. They never quote part B. But part A is, Oh, that I might know Christ in the power of his resurrection. You heard that? Oh, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. Do you know what the second part is? And the fellowship of his suffering. We don't like that. (laughs) No one wants to participate in the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. But that is one of the ways of God. And if you haven't gone through it yet, you will. And I'm here to tell you, it means you're walking down the right path of faith. And he has never leave you nor forsake you, though you may think he has. But he hasn't. You remember when the angel Lord came to Sarah and said, by this time next year you're going to have a baby. And what did Abraham's wife Sarah do? Remember she laughed? Do you know, Sarah had to wait one year for the promise to happen. Do you know how many years Abraham had to wait? 25. Abraham was 75 years old when God says, you're going to have a son, and you know what? Your seed's going to be like the stars of the heavens and the sand of the sea. Abraham had to wait 25 years. His wife only had to wait one year. Patience. Patience. In my third year of college, I wisely decided that I would marry Cindy Letterman, and we would go out to Springfield, Missouri, where I would finish up my bachelor's and my master's seminary. At the end, the last semester in seminary, we were praying and we felt God wanted us to go back to New York. We felt actually God had impressed upon us that our ministry would always be to the Northeast. And there were opportunities opening up in Springfield, Missouri. And Cindy and I were just saying, we've got to be careful because if we really believe God is leading us back to the Northeast, I don't want to disobey him. So the superintendent of the New York District of the Assemblies of God came out and Cindy was good friends with him. So we had a meeting with him and he said to me, you go get your license with the Southern Missouri District and if you get that, when you come back to New York, I will do my best to get you a church. So my mother and father-in-law, Jim and Mary Letterman, God bless them, they let us live with them until the first church opened up for us to pastor. So we had our resume out there, and, and we came home, and one week went by. Called up the district. Anything? Nope. Call us back next week. Two weeks go by. Three weeks go by. Now, I love my in-laws, but how many know it's just not the same when you're not living in your own home? It's not the same for them. It's not the same for you. And uh, it was wonderful. And I remember near the end of the third week, I was in the shower. I remember because God, I often say God speaks to you when you're most relaxed. That's why he speaks to me when I'm sleeping because I'm most relaxed. Or in a shower. You know, I'm in a shower. So, so, God, so I was having a shower, and it was in the third week, and I said, Lord, I thought you said to Cindy and me to go back to New York, go back to the Northeast. I think that's what you said to her, but nothing's happening. Please, Lord. And I get out of the shower, and I got dressed, and my wife says, hey, the New York District called. Well, you're in the shower. Patience. Don't you hate that word? It's almost a pain to use those P words. Perseverance, patience, persistence. (laughs) But it's one of the ways of God. Next scripture, please. James talks about this. I'm still working on this myself, just to let you know. Count it all joy! when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing as a follower of Christ. The sooner we realize that's one of the ways of God the sooner we realize, you know, God, I'm not happy. 
I thought you said this. It's taken forever. I feel like Job. Though you slay me, I will still trust you. I will still trust you. And I know there's some, some of you today going maybe through some type of an experience. Maybe you felt like God deceived you. Maybe you feel like God has humiliated you. Maybe you felt like God has given you promises. And the actual opposite thing has happened. I'm here to tell you, he has not deceived you. He is not angry at you. He is not out to get you. You have to trust him. And you have to tell yourself, my God is a good God. My God is a... Stand with me, would you please? I'm going to ask uh, the musicians would come down. But I just felt the Lord has laid on my heart. There's some of us today that are really going through a very difficult season in life. And it has really tried our faith. And we're all, you know, maybe you're at the place where you're saying, God, are you even there? I mean, I, I just, I feel like the heavens are brass. And I, I want to encourage you, put your trust in God. Isaiah 26 says, God will keep you in perfect peace when you keep your mind on him. Trust in the Lord, Jehovah, for in the Lord is everlasting strength. Everlasting strength. Some of you are losing strength because of the season that you're in. Perhaps it's time to come down to the altar and renew your faith and your trust in him. Maybe come down and say, God, I've been mad at you. Job said, though you slay me, yet I will trust in you. But really, it wasn't God slaying Job. It was the devil. And Job was blaming God for what the devil was doing. I wonder how many times we've done that. We've blamed God. And God says, why are you blaming me? Sometimes it's good just to come down and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to come down when I'm done praying. Maybe some of you need to come down and just say a simple prayer. I don't know what you're going through, but God does. And it's always good to come down and say, God, I'm sorry. I, I tried to pull you down on my level of understanding and I, I'm sorry. So, Father, I know there are some people today that are hurting. They've just gone through something in their life. Or maybe they're in a season of life that has pain. And they're trying to figure out why. But, Lord, we've seen from Jeremiah, he was upset with you. But as we read the rest of the story, Lord, he didn't walk away from you. He stayed close to you. You tried his faith. You tried his patience. You did something in him and for him and through him. And Lord, we know that's what you're doing in our lives, though we don't understand. But Lord, we trust in your ways. Help us, Lord. Increase our faith in you in Jesus' name.